Once again, we are late, but that's okay because we are going to go a little long with this particular live discussing weapon lights, pistol lights, flashlights, science that I don't understand, and some weapons set up that I do understand because at the end of the day, I don't actually know how guns work, they're magic. Uh, all I do is pull the trigger and they go boom, and they're boomsticks, and that's more or less the extent of my knowledge. But uh, be that as it may, uh, we're gonna spend the next hour, hour and 20 minutes or so talking about weapon lights, white lights, pistol lights, rifle lights. I do have uh, comments pulled up here in my phone, so I can go through here and cherry pick a few. Uh, we have a wide variety of pistol lights here that I can demo and show. It is currently still getting dark, but we have a way of being able to shine the light about 25 meters or so to demo uh, Candela versus Lumens, uh, you know, full batteries, 18650s versus CR123s and a dual fuel, stuff like that. And we can actually talk through some things. One of the biggest mistakes, one of the biggest mistakes that I actually see with people setting up weapon lights on their guns is forgetting intuition. Uh, or buying something cheap or possibly buying an IED, which I don't really recommend. Uh, so one of the biggest things that I focus on when it comes to putting a light on a firearm is uh, picking a light for a firearm or a placement on the weapon or my pressure pad or my push cap or you know whatever it is uh, in an in, in, in a, in a intuitive way. Uh, the way weapon lights should be treated and used is when I am going to my gun, getting on my sight picture, uh, getting a sight picture, uh, what I want to have is if I decide mentally I want my white light to come on, uh, my white light comes on right when I think it. There's no finagling with a the button. There's no changing my grip going up all the way underneath the weapon. Um, it turns on when I want it. And you wouldn't believe... You wouldn't believe how many guns I have that have come through classes that I've taught, whether it's for military, law enforcement, or uh, citizens, where I'll look at a gun and just stand there and be like, how do you turn that light on? And I'll sometimes ask students, and they'll be like, oh, I, I do this. And I'm like, oh, okay, yeah, sure, that's really cool. And then the other thing is, while they're activating the light, what's the recoil management? Because uh, activating the light is one thing, but we want to be able to activate the light while still getting you know, good recoil management so I can shoot 5 to 10 to 15 rounds without my sight jumping all over the place and having poor marksmanship and all that good stuff. So intuition, you know, when you are choosing a weapon light, is in some ways a bigger deal than just lumens. I see a lot of people, they just want to chase lumens or they chase candela or vice versa but they end up getting a light or setting it up on their gun in such a way that they're not really going to be able to use it in the first place at which point it's pointless in my opinion. I mean you can turn on the light-ish but you need to be able to turn it on to see what you're, what you're doing. The biggest argument that I see for not putting white lights on guns, so my opinion is every gun should have a white light. Handgun, rifle, subgun, uh, the only, the only uh, one where maybe you don't do it would be like a, a super long range PRS bolt gun. Um, but I know guys who still put lights on all their you know, gas guns, their DMR, stuff like that. I put them on my scars and all that stuff. Uh, especially with the new mod light OKWs and the lights that have a really focused candela. As soon as people started doing that, it's like, hey, I'm going to put that on a gun because I can actually engage out to 200 meters. Uh, with the, OK, the mod light OKW in particular, and I've got one here, um, I've actually taken these out to 200 meters with an ACOG with a three power or four power on a one to six scope, uh, and it's not a problem at all. I don't usually go to full magnification, I'm backed off a little bit, and I'm able to see just fine. Now, would I actually do that in a real situation? How realistic is that? Who knows? But I know, like to know that I have the capability to be able to you know, shine that light and be able to engage out to that kind of distance. Plus, it's also super sick because, frankly, I've never been able to do that before until about a year and a half ago or so. So the biggest misconception out there on the internet or I guess thought process, and it sounds great on paper, uh, it's great on forums, you know, you see it all over on air15.com, M4 Carbine, you know, wherever. Uh, YouTube, it comments on our page is, hey, as soon as you activate a white light, uh, they know where you are. And the answer is, well, yes, but that's kind of what it looks like. Uh, so yes, they'll know where you are, but you can only shoot what you can see. So to some extent, yes, there's going to be a risk in me activating my white light and showing people well, there goes an M-Lock screw. I'm potentially showing people or the person uh, where I am. But I also have to be able to see when I'm shooting, so that's kind of a risk that you kind of have to take uh, at, at some point. But it's also risky to get into gunfights in general, which somehow people seem to forget, and it's risky to carry a gun altogether. Uh, there's risks associated with every single thing that you do, so while this does create some risks, it also gives you lots of capability. The fact that people can't wrap their heads around that or they don't like the idea of taking risks ever. They're probably the people that take the vaccine and 
take wear 10 masks and stay home all day uh those are probably the people who are like yeah i'm not going to use the light because you know they'll know where i am so anyway um sometimes it's just how it is so uh let's see your eyes yes blinded boom just like that let's go over some questions yeah the mlock screw has gone it's gone forever i'll never get it back uh, Cloud Defensive is best. So let's go through let's go through a few brands that I have here. So my favorite brand of all time when it comes to weapon lights in general, and there's I've got I, I, I get everything Russian, American. We even have a few IED type of uh, the IED variety uh, weapon lights. Uh, we we get everything. You know weird Russian pistol. You know lights and look how dim that is. Um, so we, we do collect everything. Uh, but the number one brand out there, if I had to go to and use for the rest of my life who will have stuff for all my different guns, is Surefire. Surefire has been in the game for decades. Uh, they do produce some of the toughest, just best accessories and systems and stuff on the market, suppressors and all kinds of other things. I've got some stuff here. Uh, but they also produce lights for lots of different kinds of guns. I have an MP5 handguard. This is actually probably the, the best, kind of hard to see with the... Uh, there we go. Uh, it's probably the best accessory you can buy for an MP5. It's just a handguard that drops right in. Granted, it's about $500. It is a little expensive. Uh, and that gives me a good, uh, they, I think they say 600 lumens, uh, but the candela, the focus of the light itself uh, is really solid. Uh, it's not just a big floodlight. They actually have it directed uh, to be able to engage to a pretty good distance. Drops right in, has a constant on and off on one side and a momentary on the other side. Um, so Surefire makes stuff for shotguns drop-ins for MP5s, and then obviously they make the ever-popular, uh, constantly copied X300 pistol light, and then they also have the Scout series, the M600s, the M300s, the Vampires, all that good stuff. If I hold these just right, I'll be like Surefire Wolverine. So there we go, Surefire Wolverine with all my, there we go, let's check out all those lumens. Yeah, pretty cool. So anyway, Surefire, at the end of the day, Surefire does really good stuff. Do you pay for the name? Yes, you pay a little bit for the name, but you are guaranteed to get a quality product. I've been using them for years and they're awesome. Streamlight, big name in the game. We've got, uh, I've got one of their TLR1s as a rifle light combo. More on that later, it's pretty cool. Uh, TLR2 has a laser built into it. Oh, sweet, we have a close up right here. Nice, sick, this is great. Uh, and then of course the super popular uh, TLR1 pistol uh, light as well. Uh, they're, like, they're like 120 bucks or so and they get you going. Just make sure you replace the batteries. This is not normal. This is how, this is actually a good example. So uh, a lot of weapon lights will have their tactical run time uh, listed on the box of the light. And that's basically the time that it has full uh, illumination, full power, full battery, full lumens. Uh, after that, it goes down to something like this. This is like, I don't know, like 30 lumens or so of the supposed to be a thousand that this TLR1 does. So after a while they do dim like so, uh, just like uh, illumination and scopes like razors and uh, your EOTech and your Aimpoint. Like my Aimpoint T2s, I know they're dying when I go all the way to the top and they're more like setting eight. Uh, I'm not getting full brightness. It's just like drained and kind of dead. So this is a dead, more or less a dead TLR1. It's not fully dead, but as you can see, there's really nothing there. So just need to uh, remove the battery. Uh, real fast, just to cover it for you guys. Lumens and Candela, essentially, in layman's terms, simpleton terms, which are my favorite because I'm quite simple myself and I'm, guns are magic, I don't know how they work, I just pull triggers. Uh, lumens is the basically the, the power of the light, the amount of lumens and light it will display. The Candela is the light that is displayed in a certain direction, which is generally straightforward. So a high Candela light is one that can, such as this mod light, it goes far and has a very tight beam. A high lumen light with lame candela is more of a flood. This is a M600DF, which inside this structure right here in this distance, as you can see, is actually pretty impressive. It really gives me a lot of light, a lot of information, and that's pretty cool. The downside of this light is it puts all of it basically right in front. When you activate this on a gun, all the light's basically right in front of you, and its max range is only like 20 meters or so. This, I think this is a OKW, uh, puts it into a super tight beam, which basically focuses all the lumens, all the candela uh, right there and uh, is quite blinding. And I mean, really blinding. It's actually pretty rad. Plus you could take it out the distance. So candela lights like this, lumens usually is lights like this. So when you see companies marketing like, this is a 5,000 lumen light, 
The question isn't so much, well, how many lumens are you just spilling out there? The question is, what's the candela of the light? What kind of focus, what kind of beam will I get? Which is why you will find with M600s, I, I noticed this a long time ago. I didn't really know why, because again, I, I'm simple and I don't know how this stuff works and I'm not a scientist. But I found that some of these lights had a much better, tighter beam. Uh, this one, this is a M600. Uh, the, the, the older M600s would sometimes have a better beam. This is a newer one, so it's actually a little, uh, a little wider. Uh, than the older M600s, which were much tighter. The older M600s had a higher candela or more candela. So they actually had more range than the newer M600s that just had 1,000 lumens. And they advertised it as 1,000 lumens. But it actually just felt more floody and not as focused and long range. And I've got older M600s that are on some of my guns and they're still there because I like how tight the beam is in comparison to some of the newer ones that flood a little bit more. Now some people like the flood. It does mean you get a lot of data at short range. Uh, kind of like in a video game, you know, shotgun patterns really great, but you know, if you, you know, like the little spaceship games, you get the shotgun pattern that's really big and you get like the, the ones that just shoot faster in a straight line and it's like, which are you? And you know, that's kind of how it is. So you got f lights that flood and you have lights that direct more or less. We don't do Olights, no, we don't do that. I know they're really big on YouTube because guess what Olight did? They spent a bunch of money paying people off to say their product was awesome versus letting the product speak for itself. And they approached me, I can't tell you how many times, trying to get me to use their product, sell their product, get paid to use their product, review their product, and uh, I frankly just never wrote back. I didn't want to have anything to do with that because I will not be bought by companies uh, like that. It's not going to happen. I prefer partnerships with companies where we resell their product and we work with them, try to develop new products. Uh, none of that sort of shill stuff. It's not going to happen. We'll not allow it ever. Enforce used to be really cool. I used to use a bunch of their stuff. I feel like uh, they've, they've I don't know. I don't know what's going on over there. I don't use any of their stuff right now, but uh, I used to use a bunch of their stuff. Has to do with throw distance, reflector type, and flashlight head. Yes, there's lots of technology going on right here that is actually creating what is going on downrange as far as the lights and all that good stuff. But for the most part, lumens, while it sounds like a really awesome number, just 1,000, 2,000, 5,000, 10,000, uh, the beam is actually what you want to look for, uh, in my opinion, on a weapon. Uh, it's not, I don't want to just all spill right here and then have no distance at all. That's why one of my favorite lights, if not my favorite, happens to be the OKW or the PL, PLH V2. It is a very tight beam. I don't have a lot of data around me. I've got to scan and search a little bit, uh, but I do have this super focused beam for when I actually want to get somewhere and actually see what's going on. So it's awesome. Are ri any rifle lights under $1,000? Yes, I'm going to show you a budget rifle light setup. So the downside to all of these, Surefire M600. OKW, uh, cloud defensive, this is a cloud. They have a much more, um, you could see the yellow tone. This is sort of a, uh, Charles, is it, uh, for, the, for K, I'm trying to remember. Calvin? Is it the higher number is more yellow, lower number is bluer? Lower number is yellower, so uh, higher number is. I think it's the other way around, isn't it? No, it's like 3,000. Uh, okay, because these are 5,000, yeah. So the OKW is, I think they said it, a 5,300 uh, K. So if you go to the store, you'll find light bulbs. All my light bulbs in my house are wider, so they're like in the 5,000, 6,000 range. But it's a bluer tone versus this cloud defensive, which as you can see is yellower. Or some of these surefires are also. This one's sort of uh, yellow white, but then some of the ones over here, that one's more blue. And then this M600 is, as you can see, also quite dim is also very blue. Now as far as the actual color output of the light, the K of, of whatever it is, does it actually matter? I think it's more preference than anything. I've heard theories behind what's better and, and preferable, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I frankly think it really comes down to personal preference. I prefer sort of the whiter tone, the whiter color. I mean, that's what I buy for my own house, uh, my light bulbs, because it's more industrial and the science shows it promotes better work. Just kidding. I'm sure someone has made that correlation, but no, that's not why I have white. But uh, again, 50, uh, yeah, 5400K, yep. So, low K, warm, high K, cool. Cool, thanks, yes, that's how it is. Yellow, better in fog. So, uh, there we go. Which is, and I do remember hearing uh, people talking about back in the day that uh, old incandescent bulbs, such as this MP5 light, uh, are better at penetrating smoke. So this is an old MP5 Operation Nimrod SAS type light, as you all have seen, of a blinding, a blinding light, as you can see. Uh, it's actually, dying. I think it's dying a little bit, but uh, is actually better at penetrating smoke. Then I have some other older lights. This is a Surefire P111, and uh, 
Oh, come on, turn on. There we go. Also, blinding incandescent bulb. And uh, ooh, check that action out. So supposedly good at penetrating smoke, but the problem is these also have basically no output to begin with. So, oh, it's on. Look at that. How are you still on? Oh, it must have hit the, oh, it must have sat it on the pressure pad. Or I could just leave it on the whole time, just like this. That's nice aesthetic right there. Look how slow it turns off. That's so creepy. It's so creepy how, how slow it turns on and off. Quite dim. And I, here's the thing. I love... I'm not a collector, okay? I'm never gonna be that YouTuber who just collects stuff and sits on it. I do try to use all this. Um, but it is really cool when I see people complaining about uh, like X300s and about how like big they are and heavy they are in guns. And I'm like, well, this is where we came from. And we actually came from much larger lights on weapons. Uh, so I like having this for just overall perspective um, of weapon lights. I mean, this used to be like the only thing you could do and now we have lights such as this XC1 Bravo, which outputs uh, way more lumens, although I, again, didn't change the batteries on this before I came out here. I just need a AAA to go in here. Uh, m much smaller light that can actually be carried on your person at all times outputs a couple hundred lumens versus this huge light that was in an old Safari Land holster, like on a 1911 or a Gen 1 Glock being used for cool stuff. Uh, I, like, I like having those comparisons, you know, stuff like this versus MP5 end. I mean, MP5 light, MP5 end, just super fun, super cool. Perspective is awesome. It's lovely. This is a TLR7A. Get the pistol lights here in a minute. More questions. Do more questions before we move on. Uh, oh, yeah, budget. Oh, sorry. I got distracted, as I do. Budget lights. So under $100, how can you get a good weapon light without blowing the bank or emptying the piggy bank, turning them upside down, all the coins fall out? Uh, I have one here, or I did. Oh, here it is. So... Uh, not this one exactly, but similar. Surefire has a bunch of handhelds. And again, Surefire, love Surefire. Surefire has a bunch of handhelds that are, um, wow, that was a great demo. It literally just fell, oh, I know why. Uh, Surefire has a bunch of handheld lights that are a little cheaper. They're in the $70 range, $80 range. And something you can do, and I have some that they discontinued forever ago. I picked them up for like 50 bucks. Um, this is a Fury, it's a little more expensive. So disregard this one, you can get one that's similar. Uh, you could buy these handhelds. They have a push cap, push cap or constant. You can get a cheap ring mount for, that's like traditional to go on like an old school retro gun. And you could buy these for like $25. You can get the light for like $70, $75, go to eBay, get it used. And you have right at 100, under $100, a surefire weapon light on your gun. You won't have a super fancy pressure pad. You won't have a super fancy M-lock mount, but this will go straight to Picatinny and give you a surefire quality light on your rifle, subgun, whatever. Uh, I have these on a bunch of guns. The other option, if you want to go even cheaper and skip them out, tape. The best thing ever for mounting lights. Uh, so you can get away if you're creative with Surefire, you know, S-named products, Surefire or Streamlight on your rifle without blowing hundreds and hundreds of dollars and still having a quality light. There's also a bunch of other lights out there. Someone mentioned Phoenix and, you know, if you don't want a dedicated, like, you know, weapon light that has all the like cool mounting systems and fixtures and accessories. There are a bunch of cool handheld lights out there that are decent. You can tape to your rifle. You know, maybe you can, you know, you can fit it into one of these, you know, ring mounts or over here I have, if you want to get a little more modern, a BCM uh, ring mount. This actually key mods or M locks directly at you. There's another M lock version. Uh, M locks directly onto your rifle. You shove the light in, tighten it down, and you're set. So if you want to get creative, you can do that. Um, I've got it on a few guns. Don't think you have to have, you know, this right here with a super cool high speed pressure pad system hooked up to your laser. If you have a laser, uh, you don't have to necessarily have this. If you just need to punch some white lights down range, uh, you can do that with a handheld tape to your rifle or where did you just go? I have nothing here and now it just disappeared. Never mind. It was here a second ago. I'll find it later. There it is. I'm an idiot. Boom. Budget light, and there's the output. Not too shabby. Hundred bucks. Well, this is a Fury. It's a little more expensive. Uh, I can't remember the one I had. The, the other model number. You can find them. Zip ties are good too. You don't have to blow a ton of money. Streamlight light mount is like 130. Yeah. So this right here. So as far as budget goes, this one's really cool. Um, this one. This was their full. It's a TLR one set up as a rifle light. And when I when uh, I can't remember if they sent this or if we bought it. One of the two. Um, Picatinny straight to the gun. This is normally a pistol light, but it came with a dual pressure pad. Now, actually, we should probably talk about pressure pads because there are a few things to bring up about that. Uh, the cool thing about the pressure pad, so the front button activates the light, uh, but they actually already have a InSight 
uh, app PLC plug-in right here for PEX and app PLs and LA5s and all that good stuff. Uh, so right out of the box, I think this thing's about $140, but I actually have a pressure pad to hook up to my laser or, you know, later on I can hook it up to my laser or I can simply, I believe it also has a switch for simply activating. Uh, oh, well, there's this switch. I wouldn't recommend this. They have three settings here, off, momentary, and on. So I can actually swap the switch and then it's like permanently on. I would not recommend that though. It's not intuitive. Again, intuition, it's not intuitive. Um, again, back to intuition while we're talking about that because it's important. Surefire makes this really cool rear cap. This is called the DS00. No, I, uh, dual switch 00 is probably what it means or dual switch. Makes me wonder if they have a DS01 or something. Um, this is a really cool rear cap because it still gives you a uh, push button so that if your pressure pad fails, which can happen, you still have a way of turning your light on. Now the downside to this is this button is not intuitive at all. It is there, in my opinion, as an emergency, not as a actual like button I would want to click all the time. Before I came into this live, I had someone on Instagram ask me, hey, can you talk about activating this? And I was like, sure. But you do realize it's an emergency button, not I constantly am pushing it to activate the light itself. Uh, what I would do for that is I would actually hook up to a normal, so in this case, this is a, actually a mod light little switch. I would actually run a pressure pad to activate it all the time. This little button tucked away here is more of an emergency. If my pressure pad fails, get yanked, I lose it, I cancel, activate the light, but it's not very intuitive. It's tiny. Usually when it's rotated on the gun, it's sort of away from where your hand is. So it's cool. It is a little heavier, but it does give you that backup if your pressure pad fails, which the standard rear caps do not do. I may not even have one here. Well, I have them on these rifles over here, and we can get into that in a second. Back to here. We have these dual caps in stock at T-Rex Arms most of the time. In fact, I was talking to a CEO of, a, of an optics company recently, and he actually brought up, he, he was aware of our company, he didn't know we were a holster company, but he came to our site to buy one of these uh, rear caps, the DS00, because we were the only people that had one. And I was like, oh, well, sick, now you know who we are, because you've ordered something from us. So uh, we do have those pretty often, pretty often. Uh, what is your personal opinion on Olight quality? Olights are really good at a uh, uh, couple things. Uh, they're very good at shilling their product and paying people off. And uh, they're also really good at creating product that can, can, can potentially be used for other uses. We do not recommend Olight. There's no reason to buy Olight where you can buy Streamlight, which is a quality proven company and makes quality proven lights of the same budget, the same value, there's literally no reason to buy Olight. I can't, can't tell you how many times I've said this. They're a company with a horrible track record so far. And you have Streamlight over here who has tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of lights on the market, lights that have been used in all kinds of situations, lights that are overseas, lights being used by foreign counter-terror, you know, folks over here in the States, and you have this new company, which I would classify as like an Instagram YouTube company, who pays a bunch of people off on YouTube to say their product is awesome, when the reality is it's no better than Streamlight, it's the same price, there's no reason to buy it, plus sometimes they go boom. So why buy Olight? You're probably asking because you saw a good YouTube video out there by someone saying it's awesome. You should, uh, you should see if there are some folks who have uh, talked about that particular YouTube being paid by Olight. And if that YouTuber hasn't disclosed that they have a relationship or a financial re relationship with Olight, shame on them. You have, to, you have to disclose that at the beginning of your videos or at some point in your videos if you do have that relationship. And while I'm at it, let me see. Have I been sent anything on this table? We bought this. We bought all the Surefires. We might have been sent, we might have been sent, because they showed up. These, either we, someone in the company bought these uh, rifle stream lights or we paid for them. I bought the Russian stuff, it had to get imported. We bought the TLR1 VR2, bought the Surefire 4 end. They did recently send us another one though. Not this one though, I bought this one years ago. So it's a little older, it's like 500 lumens. The new one I think is 1,000 lumens. Um, we bought that on eBay. Uh, bought, this was hard to source, bought all that. Yeah, not, not really anything here is, it was, is free. All right, it, it, buy it, paid for. It's not a, we're not, we're not chilling for people. And when we do get said something, we try to tell you right off the bat. Sometimes you forget, but we try to tell you where we can. So back to the questions, back to the questions. As you guys can tell, I'm very passionate about shilling and the state of the industry, as you can tell. I'm very passionate about it. Um, uses, okay, so batteries. Let's talk about batteries real quick. So 
As you guys know or should know, the most common battery on the market right now for your white lights is going to be CR123s. These are Surefire CR123s, Streamlight makes them, you can Energizer makes them, I think probably Sony makes them, uh, the Bunny makes them, Energizer once again. Uh, Duracell, all those, is it the Duracell Bunny or the Energizer Bunny? Energizer, Energizer, thank you. I wasn't sure which it was. <laughs> Side out. Is it the Duracell Bunny? No. Okay. Thank you. Look, Charles obviously loves the Energizer Bunny. I don't watch uh, TV, I guess, or something. Anyway, I don't think Charles does either. So, CR123s, they're a great light source for, they get used in EOTEX, your lasers, your lights, all that good stuff. Recently, however, uh, there were some folks who came up with a new battery type. Uh, I'll go ahead and, here they are right here. Uh, 18650s and 18350s. Basically, these batteries uh, can be recharged. They're a little different in CR123s. A bunch of the really powerful lights are running off of these batteries, and you can buy chargers to go with them. Uh, Nightcore chargers, I think we've got those on our website. We sell these batteries, the ModLite batteries, for the ModLites specifically. Uh, basically, you can get some more juice out of them, which is really cool. The downside to them, especially if you get a light that can only run on these, is you cannot run your light off of traditional, standard issue, all over the world, all over the place, CR123s. Now, from an operational standpoint, I'm a big fan of having the same batteries for all my accessories. So if I have a rifle, such as, uh, this is actually a bad example. This would be a better example with an EOTech. Oh, here we go, hang on. Uh, this is a bad example too. Actually, no, this is a fine example. So MCX upper, 300 blackout, uh, unobtainium basically. Uh, my EOTech runs on a CR123. My NGAL runs on, wrong battery. Oh shoot, stay there. My NGAL runs on a CR123. If I had a CR123 light, I'd be able to run the same battery down here. Now, it just so happens I have a mod light on the bottom right here. This runs on the 18 or 18350s, the little short guys, so I have a different battery here. However, recently, thank goodness, uh, I believe they're available now uh, to the internet. True, correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, mod light came out with a dual fuel head, which can run on CR123s and the 18650s or 18350s. So in this case, and I'll actually demo, we have... A mod light bo uh, a body right here with a dual fuel head. So this is the OKW. I remember one of their guys telling me, I thought they weren't available. And then one of their guys told me, yes, they are. So the dual fuel, basically the way it works is I can actually run the traditional CR123s in it as well. However, there's a 20% or so reduction in your output. But what this means is logistically, I can, yeah, it's definitely dimmer. I can now run the same battery on this upper that takes, on this particular rifle, that takes in, uh, 123s in the NGAL, 123s in the EOTech, and I have consistent batteries across the board. I'm not a huge fan of lights that rely on, such as, I believe, the, the Rain and the older mod lights, that rely on the 18650s and the 350s, uh, because now these are completely separate from my lasers, my night vision, my optics, and you know, all that good stuff. Uh, I have to recharge them, and to some extent, I prefer just grabbing a box of these, not worrying about a charger, because <laughs> who cares about green energy, right? And uh, I can just run these batteries, don't have to worry about recharging, and I'm good to go. So again, logistics is everything. Uh, amateurs talk tactics, professionals talk logistics. So, they are available, they are available. excellent. 210-ish, for just the head. Yeah. Uh, it's fine, though. Uh, you, you pay for quality. So you can buy the head, and uh, you can be good to go. So and have CR123s or mod lights. Yeah, they are available. Surefire has rechargeable 123s. Are they actual 123s? Or are they the 18? Oh, they have, so their big fat battery that goes in the DF is not a traditional CR123. It's actually one of these. And you plug, well, they originally had one that plugged in with mini USB, and I heard that one was crap, plus I never really used them. And uh, I don't believe it's a traditional 123 that is rechargeable. It is that style of battery, which is also much fatter and is a little different. Okay, um, there's a shelf life. There, there are shelf lives on everything, yes, including human beings. Um, so, will you demo on short gun with light on strong side? Yeah, let's go ahead and talk about sort of gun setups and kind of light setups. I was going to talk about pressure pads though, but ugh, never mind. We'll get, actually, we'll get to that with the guns. So I have a few uppers here because I'm sure you guys, I mean, YouTube, this isn't a gun, by the way, YouTube, if you're watching, this is not a gun. 
uh, not a firearm, uh, is not serialized, and you can ship straight to your home, which is amazing and incredible. Uh, again, I love showing history. I love showing how far we've come. Uh, this is actually a drop-in Surefire forend, as you can tell. I really like Surefire. Um, this forend, I can't remember what the model number is. You can find them, but uh, polymer handguard with the light built in, very similar to the MP5 forend, and uh, gives you all sorts of buttons and pressure pads and stuff to activate the light. And it actually has a little nav light here on the front. Now I need to play with this a little bit because uh, the nav light has stopped working or it runs on its own battery. I need to just play with it a little bit. Uh, but as you can see, we have some blinding lumens uh, from this particular light. It's pretty old, but also pretty dope. And I picked it up on eBay for like 200 bucks. Uh, it does have momentary on one side, constant on the other. So this is just on a FSP 10.5 with the Aimpoint Pro, kind of a budget setup, built-in light, kind of fat, kind of, you know, beefy, chonky, chonky boy, uh, but is pretty cool. And now those lights might uh, not never be seen again um, because you guys are going to start buying them on eBay. They're super cool. Um, another cool example for mounting lights to rifles, if you don't want to get super crazy, uh, this is a fab defense light mount that goes to the barrel. It's the best barrel mount that I've found so far. They make uh, various versions of it, uh, but basically what it gives you is a Picatinny interface on the wherever on the barrel that you want. So on my Wolf T91 uppers, or I think that's the name, um, I can mount lights directly to the barrel. In this case, I have, once again, an old Surefire, which I think is actually dead, um, that I can mount here. But the cool thing is, because I have Picatinny, I can take any modern Surefire, such as this M600DF, clamp that straight on. I could either roll forward to push. Again, not very intuitive. I probably wouldn't do that. I would instead get a pressure pad of some sort, uh, possibly not the mod light one, the ST07 or whatever. So it'd be one similar to this. And I would just tape that pressure pad to the top and I would have a weapon light on this gun. This is probably my favorite carbine right now, to be perfectly honest. It's quite dope. So there's lots of ways of mounting your lights. If you're doing something crazy like that though, you're probably gonna want a pressure pad to make it a little more intuitive. And that's where the rear cap, the plugs, the Surefire switches and all that good stuff comes into play. Now, going a little more modern. So this is a CQBR upper, Mark 18. Um, this is actually, we did get this for free. They did send this, full disclosure, which I haven't used it yet. And uh, we'll see how it goes. It just lets you engage further without having to worry about your holds. I've been told though they're really cool, but they also are a little expensive. Uh, so in this particular case, the way I have this mod light set up, I'm going to go ahead and pull the suppressor. Oh, jeez, if I can. It might be carbon locked because I haven't pulled this from this gun in a while. Oh, I did it. And it wasn't bad. Again, never clean your guns uh, or your suppressors. The way I have this set up right here is the light is pushed forward to about flush with the muzzle. So I don't have to worry about, so as far as like my hand placement and just the intuition of the weapon, um, it's just nice and, uh, nice and compact and I'm not like bringing the light all the way to the rear. Uh, pressure pad is mounted here to the side. Again, I don't want to change my grip. You know, I'm basically gripping the gun like so at all times. All I have to do is wrap my thumb to access uh, the weapon light itself. Weapon light, if I need to roll up to the pec, all I have to do is move my thumb. I'm not having to move my entire grip over here, underneath. I want to have it all in one spot where I can basically hit the button here, roll the thumb, button, thumb, button, thumb, something like that. I'm okay with a little bit of movement. It's worked fine, especially if I know I'm in white light mode. I just leave my thumb there, activate when I need it, activate when I need it, do whatever. And then if, I'm running, if I have my nods down, I'm just running laser, then I just keep my thumb on the pressure pad or on the fire button on this LA-5 and I'm set and I am good to go. On this particular gun, if I were running the suppressor on here permanently, what I would do, and I have on other guns, don't have one right here though, is I would get our Picatinny light bar, this little guy right here. I talked about it in our latest YouTube video on the Rattler, I'm sure you guys saw it. But I would actually take this mod light, uh, bolt it here to the front of the light bar, and this light bar will attach then directly to the Picatinny on the weapon, put the light to about here. So once I add the suppressor, this is an RC2, Again, excuse me, Surefire, one of the best cans out there. I won't say the best because nobody knows what the best is. Uh, it'll put the light about right here. So no suppressor shadow out of the way from my hand, which isn't as big of a deal on this gun because right now the way this is set up, I am getting some of that splash off of the suppressor and also some shadow. As you can see that, that uh, you'll have to go wide for this, Charles. See that shadow? It's sort of uh, because the light's down here on the right, the shadow is in the top left. You can kind of see it. And uh, we can get rid of that by pushing the light further out uh, with something like the light bar. 
Modern Upper. Da -da -da -da. Uh, are there knockoff Surefires on eBay? Yes, be careful buying on eBay. You'll get lots of airsoft crap. That goes for cat tourniquets. Never buy cat tourniquets that are less than probably $25 um, because there are lots of fake tourniquets floating around for airsofters and they will break and not save lives. Uh, that's probably the worst product that you can buy fake because you don't know it's fake until it's too late. If you buy a ripoff Surefire or ripoff RMR, you will know instantly when it arrives it's fake and you won't rely your life on it. Um, but cat tourniquets and medical gear is probably the worst thing that you can buy because you don't know it's fake until you're applying it to someone or yourself and then uh, you are dead. So don't do that. Uh, buy from a reputable dealer and that's honestly one reason we carry tourniquets uh, that we buy straight from North American Rescue uh, as just another vendor you can get real stuff from and so you won't you know, die by buying potentially from eBay. Or from an airsoft store that also sells fake tourniquets. Tourniquets are probably the worst thing out there. Already talked a little bit about this. This is the uh, MCX 300 Blackout 675 barrel. I have the mod light on the bottom. Now, people ask all the time, light placement, bottom, side, left side, right side, you know, how do you know where to put it? Well, the cool thing, if you're running a pressure pad setup, so you're running a Surefire or Mod Light with the Surefire rear cap or DS00 or whatever that you plug into, uh, you can put this pressure pad anywhere, and at that point, it doesn't matter where the, right, the light is. I'm not having to rely on the light to activate or the pressure pad to, or the pressure cap to activate the light. I can literally put the light wherever I want. And because I'm running a Mod button to activate the light, I put the light on the bottom of the weapon. And the reason for that is, when I'm using this in a bag, I have no snag hazard on the right or the left of the upper when I'm actually pulling the weapon out of a bag. Uh, and that's something that you'll figure out real quick doing bag reps. Um, and because my light is here on the top, it doesn't matter that my light is on the bottom. I activate and I'm good to go. Uh, plus it's sort of MP5 style. See some, again, this light, I know I bring this up a lot because it's super cool. Uh, very, a lot of similarities. The downside to mounting your light here on the bottom is if you're doing barricade work, like at a competition or something like that, you go to mount on something and now you have this thing you need to, you know, you have to push forward and make sure you mount here instead. And then if you, you know, pull through a port, it catches. And so there are some downsides, but for bag work, mounting your light to the bottom is great. As far as mounting on the left or right side of the gun, you know, left or right bias, um, what I do, if I have a folding stock law folder or MCX, I will put the light on the same side as where the stock is when the stock is folded. So everything is flush on one side. So it's not like stock folds to this side, light is over here. Granted, does it make a big difference? Nah, not too much, um, but it just makes it a little more consistent, keeps it on the same side. If I put the bag on the opposite side in the bag, a little bit easier to pull out. So in this case I have, oh shoot, stay in, please. Uh, I have, this is a MCX 11 and a half upper with a, this is a good example of the uh, light bar. Key mod light bar pushing a mod light all the way to the front. I have minimal splash on the suppressor as you can see. There is a little bit, I would need a shorter suppressor or a longer weapon light in this case, or a longer rail. Um, but this is a lot less suppressor shadow than if I had a traditional light mounted all the way back here. So when I actually activate my light, get back in there, there is, as you can see from this range and this distance, there is no suppressor shadow at all. So I have all my lumens, all of the candela, all of the light, all of the lovely stuff that I need to be able to see. And the light bar is, uh, well, it's pretty cool. Plus there's some really cool people that have been using it. We've sent some overseas, we've sent some to some other countries, and uh, lots of cool people are using it, and it's super cool. Let's get to some questions. Oh cool, YouTube has this weird thing that does stuff. When I turn the phone and I get full view, I can still see the comments. That's actually pretty dope. Oh geez, I've been talking a lot. All right, uh, have you any thoughts on the rain from cloud? Let's talk about that real quick. So I do have one. We went and bought one a while ago and um, they're doing everything proprietary. Now, there's two things about it that I like and don't like about that. What I don't like about it is it's proprietary. I cannot use other companies equipment or stuff such as Unity Taps, which has an insight plug for my PEC 15s, LA5s and at PLCs and the switch to plug into the light itself. It's all proprietary, so I can't use any of my existing stuff. I can't set this up to a laser and have the same kind of pressure pad setup. I've been told that they're like working on some stuff or whatever, I get it, their own system. Now the benefit of them doing their own proprietary stuff is they get to control supply. 
And from a logistics standpoint, like I mentioned earlier, professionals talk logistics, that can be important. You're not relying on Surefire making rear caps, you're not relying on Surefire making enough pressure pads, you're not relying on Surefire making this, that, whatever, fill in the blank, uh, because they can control it all themselves. So with that said, I do value they're looking ahead as far as uh, creating their own supply and having full control over that. At the same time though, their pressure pad is pretty lackluster in terms of features. Um, I think they're, they're modifying a couple things about it, which is great. So I have a like and dislike for what they're doing. It doesn't work with all my existing stuff, and I do have quite a bit, as you all have seen, with stuff like the Armory video. Uh, but at the same time, they will have a little more control. Now, as long as they take advantage of that control and make enough, uh, time will tell. As far as the light itself, it is huge. It has good output, very similar to like a PLH V2. I would put this on the same kind of playing field as one of those, uh, but it is quite a bit bigger, a little heavier. They boast a lot of durability. Uh, they do a bunch of crazy testing on their Instagram and throw it all around and do crazy stuff. Uh, and that's awesome. Although to some extent, there's a limit to how far some of that needs to go. Um, that's something people never really talk about. People demand like, I want mil spec ratings. I want the toughest, most durable, the cheapest, the lightest. And it's like, well, you can't actually have all that. They went and made a super durable light, but at the cost of it being bigger and heavier. Is that worth it? Maybe to you guys. I don't need that kind of durability because this thing has worked fine so far and I don't see these busting and breaking all the time and it's lighter. So it really comes down to what do you want? Do you want the toughest light on the market, which this might be, or the best durability at the cost of more weight? That's for you to decide. Um, but I think current lights right now, like the Surefires, you know, the M600 Scouts and the Mod Lights, which are smaller, a little more traditional, are just fine. And if you're someone who only shoots once a month, pulls your gun out of the closet, you're thinking about civil unrest, but you're probably not doing any like, you know, year-long operations or anything crazy, uh, you probably don't need something super robust like this. You can probably get away with something a little more standard. And to be quite honest, this is probably more robust than any of us need, to be perfectly honest. Like there's a ton of optics out there that technically are more durable than we really need. We're not doing stuff for years on end. It's not cycling through an armory, getting issued from one unit to the next unit, to the next unit, to the next unit. Um, it's not something that's gonna be floating around for 20, 30 years. Uh, but people seem to disregard or forget that. And they're like, oh, I just want the best thing right now. And it's like, well, it's gonna be expensive and heavy. And they're like, oh, well, uh, oh, well. <laughs> so, uh, Surefire Mod Light, either. Uh, I think mod light's great as far as if you want a light that has a lot of range. Uh, I like Surefire for the simplicity. They do come in, I believe, a little bit cheaper than mod lights right now. Uh, now that mod light has dual fuel heads, they can take traditional CR123 batteries, which I think is awesome. Um, I personally, like I said, logistics love just having CR123s and not having to worry about recharging batteries because uh, the environment, yeah. I'm kind of joking, okay, sarcasm. I'm like, come on, like, give me a break. Anyway. Uh, TLR7, yeah, pistol lights real quick. So what I carry with right now, I use an X300, so the two weapon lights that I use are the X300, well, I have others like the XVL2 and the X400 and some other stuff like that. Uh, oh, I just remembered, Surefire did give this one to me. So another disclaimer, they did give me the XVL2 at Chacho two years ago, and we just ordered like 10 more, I think, something like that. Uh, so they did give me a light, full disclosure. Um, but the lights that I use, I have lots of other lights that I use, like the X400, the TLR v, VI2, you know, I use all of them, X300, Vampire, all that. But the two lights that I'm actually using for like carry, at the range, you know, doing my stuff, is the X300 Ultra, so this guy right here, so very common, the U-Boat, whatever they call it, the X300 U, um, boasts, I think they now say a thousand lumens, but the older ones had much better focused candela, so in some ways I actually like the older ones more than the newer ones. Uh, and the TLR7 Alpha, the Streamlight TLR7 Alpha. So this is a Streamlight, not an O-Light. And the reason I like this light right here is, going back to the thing I talked about at the very beginning, intuition. There are very few lights out there that have really solid intuition. Where when I present the pistol, or I present the you know, rifle, pressure pads, you're good to go. But when I present the pistol, I can push a button, not lose very much recoil control, have good consistency, but be able to activate good white light. So the thing I like about the TLR7 is, the pressure, the pressure switches act like gas pedals. My thumb literally sits down here like this and I push into it to activate. There's very few lights that allow you to do that, uh, especially like the Enforce and some of the other ones where you have to like push inwards and that doesn't really help with the recoil. Um, you're like recoil management and stuff. But the TLR7 Alpha, the new TLR7, 
Not the old one, because the old one forced you to like roll your hand off the gun, and it was absolutely ghastly and horrible. And we didn't make holsters for it for that reason. Uh, people don't really realize that, though. Uh, but when the TLR7 came out, with the new switches, we were like, this is the coolest little light out there right now. Five, I think it's 500 lumens uh, or 400 lumens. Uh, it has some very decent candela, very decent throw. Uh, but the best part is the intuition. Uh, so that's my favorite thing about this light. It sits flush with the 19. It's what I carry with every day. Uh, on occasion, I will have an X300 though because I'm switching between like, like my Ragnarok range stuff, put on a sidecar for an X300, I'm good to go. It doesn't matter. TLR7 Alpha. Don't buy the old one. Buy the new one. The new one's awesome. We have them at T-Rex Arms. They might not be in stock though because they, they sell out. They're crazy. They're, they're gone. They might be there. They might be there. I should have done some double checks before doing this, but you know. DG grip. Yeah, DG grips. I don't have any right here. Uh, basically, Surefire makes these switches. You remove, you remove the back piece on the Surefire. So this is a X300 Vampire. You remove this piece right here, and then you can add in a pressure switch. It's built around certain guns, though. You can't just get one for the Glock and put it on your 226. It won't work. You then get the Glock-specific DG switch, which stands for... Let's assume it stands for drop grip. I don't know. I actually don't know what it stands for. Uh, Surefire has some weird naming schemes. Um, it then curls around and ends up being right here underneath your trigger guard near the mag release. And here's what's cool about it. When I squeeze the gun, I activate the light. When I'm gripping my pistol, I'm activating the light. The downside is when I go to draw, generally speaking, because I'm gripping the pistol, my light is activated shooting at my feet. When I bring the gun out, my light is activated. My light is activated. I come off the gun, my light is still activated. I reload my gun, my light is still activated. Not great, not great for light discipline. The DG switch, while it does allow you to activate with one hand and shoot really effectively, uh, requires a lot of training to get good at not activating it. Because it is there, just sitting there at any moment where when I squeeze the gun, tighten up, or I'm just gripping the gun normally, uh, that light is activated. So that's a bit of an issue. I rarely see those anymore. They were really big a while ago. As you can see, older lights had them built in, such as this one right here. Uh, blinding lumens, I might add. Look at that. It's just incredible. Just look at that. Um, but when I go to grip the gun, it's on. You know, I grip the gun, it's on. I do my stuff. I draw from the holster. My light's on. Grip, on. See what I'm talking about? That's the DG switch. I think uh, Streamlight might have some as well. Uh, I don't really see those anymore. Drop grip. Is that actually what it's called? Was that right? Is that what I said? Be incredible if I was right first go. Holsters for the XSC. So I believe those are being worked on. I'm a little disappointed about the XSC for a few reasons. Like the old TLR7, I have to break my grip to activate it. It is also one of the only lights that will attach directly to the smaller guns, like Glock 48 MOS, the 365, and I think the Hellcat. Uh, but I'm actually looking forward to the TLR7 sub, which appears to be Basically the same as a TLR7A, so the one that I like, the, the one that uh, was around here somewhere. Uh, it's just downsized a little bit, but the same uh, activation technique. Um, so I don't, I don't really like the XSC. I've played with them, I've shot with them. I don't, I don't know. Mm -mm, no, I don't think so. Grip zone. Yeah, I know. Um, if there were a DG switch under the pinky, that would be way easier. Yes, that would be. I like that. Um, M600 IB and Telebeam auto gate feature is killer. I agree and I disagree. So Surefire has a, a technology and probably some other folks as well. I have one back there actually um, in the armory. It's a M600 with an intelligence, it's basically an auto gating uh, white light where it has a sensor in the front that detects how close you are as you're activating a light and actually scales the lumens accordingly. Now I actually haven't seen the, sca the lumens scale that drastically from like super short range to then you know long range um, it seems a little bit like a gimmick the entire light is a lot heavier and I just really haven't seen people using them I think the, fe the feature has some merit although the downside is if I'm at close range let's say Chad's sitting down here don't look at me Chad if I'm really want to pop this many lumens at him, you know, or Charles back there, um, I don't really want that to auto gate. I don't want this to get dimmer because I'm closer. I want all of it right there. Um, and that's the depth for all of you in bed, like with the lights off and looking at your phone. Apologies. Um, just kidding. Uh, so that's kind of the issue with the auto gating stuff. If you're at close range and you're white lighting someone or you're putting it in their eyes or whatever, um, 
I just I wouldn't want it to scale. I would want it to just be blasting full everything. So absorb all of it. So anyway, how low of lumens is enough to temporarily blind someone? Uh, it's going to depend on a lot of factors. Uh, distance, did you just wake up? How sensitive are you to light? Uh, have you already adjusted to the lighting conditions you're already in? I don't think there is a one-stop shop answer to that. Um, obviously, all of these lights are bright enough to do something. Um, you know, M600, Mod Light, uh, TLR7. But as you can see, you can still kind of see me a little bit. This isn't, you know, super bright. Uh, versus my EDC, which is a Surefire EDLC2. This is quite a bit brighter than my TLR7A. And just because you have a light on your pistol doesn't mean you shouldn't carry a handheld. Because I don't pull my pistol out to, you know, look around and see where I'm going. Uh, that's what I use this for. And this is also brighter and gives me some extra batteries as well for my weapon light should I need them. So carry a, a, a light. Big deal. I've used this on people all the time. Um, but not my pistol, because that's how you brandish and get misdemeanors and or uh, felonies um, if you do it wrong. <laughs> but flashlights are great. You can just, you know, flashlight people all day and it's okay. Uh, more or less, uh, within reason, of course. Um, carrying at the moment. No, because my, uh, it's over there. My, uh, my light is here and so my gun's over there. Plus this is YouTube. Uh, <laughs> it's alive on YouTube. So. The Protac lights are pretty good, yes. I've heard goods and bads about them. Uh, good, you know, hits and misses with them, literally. Uh, but they can be good, yes. Stilettos. That's the weird-shaped Surefire. I haven't had time on that. I, it looks like it has some crazy features. Yes, lots of J.J. Abrams. Yeah, lots of lens flare. I like it. Actually, Charles, next time we should get the fishing twine, put it in the front of the lens, and then have epic lens flares. We'll do that next time. We'll, we'll do it next time. Next time we do a white light one. Um, is T-Rex Arms going to have mod light PL350 holster compatibility? Um, actually, I'm not the one to ask. Uh, I actually don't know. Uh, it's very possible. Um, that would be a question for the dev guys. I actually don't know uh, what's going on with that. To be quite honest, I'm probably not going to use one. And here's why. This all goes back, again, intuition. Everything's about intuition. Your white lights, your, your gear, your stuff. It's all about intuition. How you actually use the item. They don't have momentary activation. And I should have touched on this earlier. Weapon lights basically come with two different things. They come with momentary, where as long as I hold this down and release, the light turns off, turns off, turns off. This is my favorite way to activate a light because when I go off the gun to do a reload or I go off the gun because I'm going high ready or you know going low ready and I don't want to spotlight my position or whatever, I get to decide when the light comes on and turns off. And it's literally like split second, I can't tell you how fast my thumb just comes off and it turns off. They also come with, in most cases, lights will come with a constant option, which in this case on the Surefires, the default Surefires, is a click switch. So once it is clicked, it is on. Uh, the reason I don't like these particular switches is under recoil while you are shooting with the rifle in, let's say, momentary. I'll tighten this down. Uh, I will accidentally hit the clicky on it without realizing it. And then I go to reload, and what do I know? My light is still on, and it's all over the place, and that is not good light discipline. So I prefer, in this case, Arasaka, I believe this is an Arasaka, Arasaka momentary only. There's also a modification you can do to these to get rid of the constant feature. Remove that, add the momentary, and now there's no constant on feature, unless I screw this all the way in. Then it's constant. Ro pull it, uh, rotate it back, back it off, and now, oh, actually, this might be a clicky. Oh, is this a clicky? No, no. This might be, I might have the wrong one. Oh, I do, I do. This is from something else. I've been bamboozled. I've been tricked. Okay, well, here's one. This is momentary. So momentary only. This has no click. So I can push into this as hard as possible, and when I come off, it is off. So momentary and constant. Now, I believe momentary is very important for the reasons I described earlier, and the same goes for pistol lights. I push forward on the pistol light. When I come off, it's off. Push forward, turns off. Where's the TLR7 that I had? TLR7, push down, come off the gun, it's off. Come off the gun, do my reload, come back on, it's on. Off, present, present, and I'm set. Uh, but the new PL350 does not have a momentary option. It is constant only, and I think that is a big problem. Uh, that's how the XC1 originally was, and then they changed it. So the XC1 Bravo, uh, which is the new one, you can, or no, no, it only had a momentary, it did not have constant, it was the opposite. 
And the problem with that is then you have no way of activating it with one hand, which in this case it is dead. But you tap once on one side, it's constant, and then you hold for momentary. So they actually went the opposite direction. Uh, you actually do want both. Oh, it is turning on. Well, ish. Oh, shoot. There we go. That's the, oh, it's the stupid constant, the momentary switch. Yeah, so I can hold, tap once, and it turns on. Sweet. The new one's pretty cool. It is only like 200 lumens, though. So I probably will not use the mod light simply because there's no momentary feature on it. And I think that's a problem. Hopefully they fix it in the future, but it sounds like they said, no, it's stupid, which I think is stupid. But that's my opinion. They have their opinion. It's okay. Our night class is a must. Uh, I think there should, I think that is a big, um, I think that is a big, oh, what's the word? Void in the industry. Uh, I did a Q and A on my Instagram recently and someone asked, what's the biggest void in the industry right now? I said force on force classes, uh, but another one is low light. Uh, there are a few little, as far as shooting performance goes, there's not a whole lot revolving around white light use. Um, turn it on when you need it, turn it off every other time. That's kind of the premise, whether tactically or performancely you're looking at. You don't just leave the light on all the time. There's no good reason for that unless you're like in a match setting where dudes do do that. They just turn it on at the beginning, you know, buzzer goes, they turn it on run through, they don't care, gun goes up, down, they don't care, it doesn't matter. Um, but if you operate under the pretense of, I only turn the light on when I need it and I turn it off all other times, you're already ahead of the curve of a lot of police departments and just people in general. You don't need a class to teach you that. Uh, honestly, dry fire is good enough for just working your intuition of your weapon light, whether it's on your rifle or your pistol. I draw the pistol, activate the white light, come off of it. Activate the white light, come off of it. Rifle from low ready, turn on the white light on, turn it off. Turn it on, turn it off. Um, you can do all that outside of a class setting. Where white light classes can be good is they do teach you some of the more, I guess, intricate techniques or whatever. Uh, thinking about your, your, how backlit you are, what kind of rooms you're in. It's usually better for like CQB. Um, so I do think there should be more white light classes, but the reality is just learning how to manipulate the technology on your weapon, you can do that yourself with dry fire. And frankly, people don't do that enough. I don't do that enough. I should be dry firing with my white light on my handgun more than anything. Rifle's really easy. You have a button, your thumb goes on it, turns on, turns off, turns on, turns off. I don't have to practice that quite as much, but pistol, absolutely for sure, especially with the next 300. <coughs> strobe. Yeah, strobe. Not a big fan of strobe. This guy's saying he's used one on a mountain lion. That's really cool. Um, but yeah, no, I'm not a huge fan of strobe. TLR1s have that feature. Uh, a few other lights do. I wouldn't play with it. I wouldn't mess with it. Uh, if you have momentary, you can also simulate it yourself if you really want to. Uh, but I don't think it's uh, super duper important. That's my opinion, though. You can, you can have your own or challenge mine or whatever. It doesn't matter. What are the shortcomings? So the biggest shortcoming with the X300, in my opinion, is the, the, in, the buttons itself, the intuition. So I have the ability to go momentary, you know, push forward for momentary, push down for constant. The switches are pretty stiff. Um, so when it comes to one-handed manipulation, you know, manipulating the switch and then coming off, um, I, wish, I wish they could tweak it so the switch was more like a TLR7 uh, Alpha, where I can actually push down on it and get momentary instead of pushing down and getting constant. Because oftentimes what occurs is I'm pushing forward on the button for momentary, in recoil I accidentally hit it on constant, and then, oh, I'm on constant, I gotta switch it off. Um, I think the switches could be improved. I was hoping the mod light would have more improved switches, the PPL350 or whatever they call it. Um, that's probably the biggest shortcoming, but everything else about the light is good to go. Um, you, you can complain all day about how big it is or how uncomfortable it is wearing an appendix, but hey, it's not one of these suckers uh, like I showed earlier. So complaining is um, lame and for suckers. Um, it's still a great light even at the size. T-Rex and Lucas disagree. Hey, look, we have disagrees here all the time. All the time. You, you need disagreements. Chad, stop smiling. All right, um, you can disable strobe. Yes, you can. Lights that have strobe features, usually you can look at the manual and you can reprogram it. You can hold the button down for 30 seconds or push the button or do whatever and you can actually change the settings. There are reasons to read the manual. Sometimes, rarely, but sometimes there are. Uh, no, I'm not streaming later. No Twitch later. I have stuff to do. I have to, fil I have to film more after this, actually. So, uh, which iron sights work well? Yeah, so iron sights. This is another a lovely misconception about sights and tritium and night sights and all that good stuff. Night sights were the pinnacle of handgun technology and cool factor back in 
the early 2000s, really. Tritium, sights on Glocks, Glock 22s, police guns, issued guns, Trijicon, all that good stuff. The problem with night sights are, as soon as you activate a light that is more than probably about 100 lumens, um, such that's actually dead, uh, so yeah, more than this, uh, you activate the X300, uh, you are not going to see those tritium sights anymore. Uh, you're going to be focusing on the light pattern, the threat, the target, the whatever. Uh, you are not going to see those sights at all, unless this light is super dim or you're shooting really far away. Uh, tritium sights just aren't that useful or helpful uh, as people believed like 20 years ago, or even probably 30 years ago. Um, white, high powered white lights like this drown them out instantly as soon as you activate them. Where tritium sights can be kind of fun is with uh, night vision. So if you don't have a red dot on your pistol, under nods they do show up pretty bright and you can sort of align them and have a decent reference point. But as soon as you activate an IR illuminator like an X300 vampire or something else, or I guess the mod light with an IR head, uh, you're not going to see those anyway. So I don't play with tritium sights anymore. They're not on my guns. I either have optics or just blacked out or uh, high vis orange. I don't do tritium. The iDot Pros that I have do have a tritium front sight post. No tritium in the rear, I believe. Um, and that can be nice under night vision, but I do not rely on it at all for this because this drowns it out instantly. Don't waste the money on tritium. Get a good light, and then eventually you can go up to a red dot and you'll be good to go. Tritium just doesn't work. It doesn't work anymore. It worked, it worked great when lights were like, uh, where, where is it? Here. They worked much better when lights were only that bright. They would still be nice and bright, but they don't really work with high powered lights anymore. Viridian. I was, funny you mentioned Viridian. I was actually looking at their stuff again last night. Uh, I've used their stuff here and there. Almost nobody makes holsters for them. Their lights aren't that great. Their lasers, I believe that's their bread, I mean Viridian lasers. They're, that's their bread and butter, um, but people don't really use lasers on pistols anyway. Uh, for lots of reasons and uh, so I was just looking at them. The downside to the Viridians just from looking at the photos and I've used them before it's been years is they have side activation so when you go to activate you have to push onto the side of the gun which is not always very intuitive and for recoil management isn't very good either. My phone keeps rotating let me disable that real quick. Um, Oh, geez T-Rex whoever's on the T-Rex account as the moderator is going ham oh my goodness. Um, yeah, uh, AA batteries suck for high intensity electronics, indeed, yes, but that's probably more science stuff you know about more than I do, actually. Um, Steiner, SB, I haven't used one of those. It looks pretty cool. I have the D-Ball uh, PL, which is their IR Viz setup for night vision. That's like $900. Um, I've used that here and there. I do like the switch to activate it. It has, uh, I think the same switch is on the SBAL, if I'm not mistaken, uh, but I haven't used one of those. It's a slimmed down version with, I think, a little bit less features, and uh, I definitely want to play with that a little bit. Yes, Battlefield looks cool. We'll, we'll, we'll see on June 16th or 14th uh, how the gameplay is. We'll, we'll see. Uh, just could be horrible. It could be sucky. Uh, favorite switch. My favorite switch, so my favorite light setup as of right now, as of whenever this video is coming out, so today, what I don't know what the date is, June whatever. My favorite light setup probably is this sucker right here. So mod button and or it could be a ST07, but pressure pad button for the light, pressure pad or, especially on the end goal, pressure pad to activate the laser and they're separate. Dual pads have their place, they're super cool. I have one on the Rattler for a few reasons. Uh, but the problem with the dual pads, such as the Surefires, uh, I should have one right here. Well, I have Unity Taps. We could just, yeah. oh no, no, here, Surefire. I'll use a Surefire. I, I've used these for years. The problem with these right here is the buttons are so close together that without a lot of training, and I mean a lot of training, it is really easy under night vision you're doing your reload, you're doing your stuff, you come back up to the gun to activate the button back here, you slip literally half an inch and you activate your white light, which under night vision is a big no-no if you're trying to not let people know where you are and you're shooting a suppressed 300 blackout from a different angle and you don't want to all of a sudden activate your white light, and especially if it's a high lumen white light and literally show everyone where you are. So I've actually stopped using dual pads on most of my guns, and I try to have the buttons spaced out a little bit more. So if I'm going to my night vision, like my, my activation for my laser, it's completely separate than my pad for my white light. 
Um, so I've kind of moved away from the dual pads, like the Unity Taps, the Surefire, or you know, like this older Insight right here. Uh, just because under training, you're moving, the, uh, grabbing the gun, you know, opening a door, get back on the gun. Oh, I just hit the white light by accident instead of my laser. Uh, it can create all sorts of problems. So my favorite setup is keeping them separate. Pressure pad for laser, pressure pad for white light. It could be a Surefire pressure pad, the STO7. You know, maybe in the cloud defensive, I have one here somewhere. The little, the little thingy, majig the, to keep the pad right there could be zip tied, and then the pressure pad for that laser, depending on what it is. And I keep them both separate at different angles on my gun, so that I won't act accidentally activate one of them. Again, intuition is big. You know, thumb for this button right here. Roll the thumb forward for my laser, and they are very separate when I'm indexing the gun, depending on you know what I'm trying to activate. So that's my favorite setup right there for light. Currently, it's a mod light. I also use Surefires a lot. It's one of the two. Um, even though I do have a rain and I have all this other stuff, uh, I prefer the OKW. So uh, actually, it's the PLHV2 right here. So it's kind of, you have some good throw, but you also have that good distance. I believe this can go out to about 100 meters or so. Uh, maybe a little less, but I think, I think it's about 100 meters. Um, and then I just run a mod light button and or a surefire switch, and I call it a day, and I'm good to go. And we have all of that available at T-Rex Arms because it's awesome, and we sell awesome things. And we try to keep them in stock. That's actually the biggest goal. Okay, a couple more questions before we go. A couple more. Yeah, don't buy Olight when you can buy Streamlight. There's no reason. There's literally no reason to buy Olight when Streamlight exists. If Streamlight didn't exist, I would understand why people would go spend $90 on Olight when there are $300 Surefires. I would at least understand the disparity between both vendors. But you have Streamlight, which is over with Olight. So it's like... I, why? Besides YouTube people saying O lights are great, but never using Streamlight. So anyway, uh, no, no bombs. Um, so trying to trying to see some questions in here. Do the uh, cables actually get affected when the gun gets hot? No, I haven't had any issues on any of my guns with the cables falling apart. I'm sure the uh, the coating that they're using for all the wires on the inside is a high temperature rated uh, cabling. Uh, ha haven't had any issues. You definitely want to tie your, your cables off so when you're transitioning or the gun's riding on your kit, it doesn't snag, pop it out of the light, you come up to activate and now it's not hooked up anymore. So you do want cable management, but I've had no issues, no. You probably don't want the cable sitting on your suppressor. That would probably melt right through, uh, but on the rail you're good to go. Oh boy, uh, MMP 2.0 holsters with TLR7. We'll we'll work on it. We'll fi we'll figure stuff out at some point. But again, I'm not the guy who does that. That would be Isaac and the Dev team. One of them might be on here. Actually, there's probably a couple of them on here listening. So anyway, uh, now people are asking questions on guns, not lights. Look, I'm trying to answer questions on lights. We're talking about lights. We can talk about guns another time. Or if you want to ask me questions about guns, you can watch my Twitch streams and talk to me for like five hours off and on because, you know, I'm gaming. High-level competitive gaming. Uh, at least I think so. And then uh, also Instagram streams as well. But I'm only doing like once, one a week for that. 18650 or 18350. Uh, it's going to depend on your light. If you have a short, a short light, such as this mod light right here, you are not going to be able to fit the 18650s. Obviously, it's not going to work. Uh, you can fit the short ones. That's what it's designed for. Uh, in the longer lights, you just stack two short or one long. I uh, don't actually know which is more preferable in that situation as far as output and or uh, run time. I'm sure there's some difference somewhere, but I actually don't know exactly what it is. It's probably very minimal. Uh, just get whatever fits in your light and call it a day. You will be good. So, best light for your concealed pistol. As of right now, I believe, in my opinion, this is my opinion now, this is, you know, people can debate it, but in my opinion, the best EDC light for a standard service gun, a standard duty gun, is the TLR7 Alpha or the Surefire X300. The TLR1 is also a good light. There's some other little compact lights that are pretty cool. I think the TLR7 is probably the superior light right now due to the intuition, the output, and the size. You could get, you could put them on all sorts of different guns. Uh, the activation, again, from the beginning, intuition, intuition. That's how products should be designed from the get-go. 
any, pretty much any product should be designed with intuition from the get-go. It astounds me when companies in the industry seem to forget that or their engineers aren't shooters or their you know, devs aren't shooters and they create this product that's got really cool specs but you can't even use it, at which point it's useless. Uh, but TLR7, super good intuition and ergonomics, uh, plus good output, uh, plus it's inexpensive, uh, plus you can throw it on your, what, almost whatever service pistol you have. Glock 19, 17, longer guns, M&Ps, whatever it is, fill in the blank, you're set, you're good to go. So this is what I'm using right now. This is my favorite right now. I also swap with the X300. Nicer to carry, too. Nicer to carry, a little more comfortable, sits flush with a 19. Uh, these are the two right now. There's some other ones out there. Try them out, but these are what we're using at T-Rex Arms right now. Um, and uh, that was a light ND, you don't want to do that. Um, and so, yeah. But I hope all this was helpful, guys. I know there's a lot I didn't touch. There's a lot of stuff on white lights and lasers and setups. We didn't even talk about IR light. We didn't talk about different systems you can get for omitting light in the IR spectrum that is invisible to the naked eye and what options there are on the market. And some of these guns have them. I've got other ones here and then lasers and night vision and all this cool stuff. I probably need about 20 hours or more total of these lives to actually get through uh, the majority of sort of the information out there because this was just an hour and 15 minutes or so on just this stuff. Um, so we'll get to that. We'll get to that. And we'll keep answering y'all's questions. Uh, if you guys have other questions, though, you can always head over to T-Rex Arms, over to our website, our company. Uh, this is where I'm standing right now. And this is the company. And uh, you can email our customer service guys on questions on lights or pressure switches or compatibility on different weapons and rails and all kinds of stuff like that. And they can hook you up and let you know what's going on. And uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's how we do things at T-Rex Arms. So thanks so much for tuning in. I will see you guys next time.